The Reds are on to the nation's capital after suffering yet another loss at the hands of the Philadelphia Phillies. God, I'm glad that series is over. The roster continues to be very confusing, and the Reds' handling of the entire situation is, well, it's a little confounding at best. But there are still some young players on the Major League roster that we are excited to watch. We're going to talk about them, we're going to talk about this team, and a whole lot more on today's Locked on Reds. Let's go. You are Locked on Reds. Your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds with myself, Jeff Carr, and my co-host, Stephen Offenbaker. We are lifelong fans of the Cincinnati Reds, and we've turned an addiction into information for you. Thank you so much for watching and listening. And if this is your first time, make sure that you're subscribed. We're happy to have you. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen because we're free and available on all platforms. On today's podcast, we are going to look at a couple of pitchers who really showed out last night, some guys that we want to continue to see more of as the season gets into its home stretch and comes close to an end for the Cincinnati Reds. We've also got an awesome conversation, a bit of it, at least Steve got the chance to talk with Annie Sabo and she's got an interesting take as to who the best rookie pitcher is on this team. But we have got to start with yet again, Steve, something that I talked about a little bit yesterday, and I definitely want to talk with you about here today is the Reds and the way that they're managing this roster and the way that they handle guys with injuries and guys who get hurt during the game and things like that. Because yet again, last night they were presented with a situation that they didn't necessarily handle very well. And by the way, before we get into that, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by bet online. Bet online has you covered with this season's props, odds, and lines like never before. Check out bet online. It's where the game starts. All right, Steve. So by the way, the roster uh, handling for the Cincinnati Reds, it's just confusing at this point. What, what are we doing? You know, I think there's two questions and the Reds are answering the question by saying we've seen a narrative shift. Uh, it's all hands on deck preaching the the company line that, you know, this is the time of year where everybody's a little nicked up and they're going to play hurt and, you know, they're going to battle through some things and, and, and they're just going to tough it out because, you know, this time of year, everybody's hurt and on and on and on and on and on. Okay, fine. Cool. If you're playing through an injury, it means that you are playing. If you are battling through an injury, it means that you are on the field. Mike Moustakis hasn't been on the field in three days. He's not playing through an injury. He's taken up a roster spot from somebody else that could be playing that's the difference i have a real problem with the reds playing shorthanded i've been complaining about this all season long uh they are not in a position where they have so much talent that they can afford to just eh, we'll just not bring anybody up for a day they they're not that team they need all hands on deck all the time so for me it's a question of are you letting guys play through things or are you reluctant to put a guy on the injured list because you don't want to start somebody's service time or you don't want to increase payroll by adding more league minimum guys this late in the season or are you you know trying to get somebody ready to fill a utility role which i think we're going to talk about here in a little bit but there's a lot of reasons why they're not bringing guys up and none of them have to do with we're just letting guys battle through it no, and to be honest with you, the only reason that you let a guy battle through that is because you're competing for something. Like, the main reason that you don't put a guy on the IL, you let him sit on the bench, and hopefully he heals in a day or two, is because you're like, well, we don't want to take him out of the lineup for two weeks. What is the consequence right now of this Cincinnati Reds team taking somebody out of the lineup for two weeks? Are they going to not win less? Like, is it going to be, oh, hey, look at that. We just got swept by the Phillies for four games. But if we had had so-and-so, well, we're still getting swept by the Phillies in four games. Like, well, I, I don't understand this whole let's wait to put them on the IL thing. You know, the other piece of it, Jeff, is, and, and here's what bothers me the most. They're continuing to run Jonathan India out there who's been hurt since the Field of Dreams game. Are they doing more damage? Are they going to ultimately cause him to be hurt longer or to not be able to ever fully recover. We don't know, but I don't like the look of the thing. Uh, yesterday, 
Nick Senzel pulls his hamstring going for a, a bunt and they leave him in the game. And clearly in the ninth inning, you know, he's hobbling around the bases like I was running the bases. I mean, <laughs> I think I could have run the bases as well as Nick was moving around in the ninth inning. So, you know, I think it's a bad look. And uh, I think we've got some uh, comments from David Bell on Nick Senzel. Yeah, he um, on the, the play, um, the bunt hit um, just the way he he reached for it, um, kind of grabbed his hamstring. So um, he was able to stay in the game. We'll have to just see how he is tomorrow. But uh, yeah, he definitely wasn't r running full speed um, there in the ninth inning. So why uh -huh. was he still in the game? He uh -huh. couldn't run the bases. You know why he was still in the game? He was still in the game because they were already wasting a roster spot with Mike Moustakis. The other guy that could play third base is Kyle Farmer. He was the DH. You put him in the field, you give up the designated hitter, and now the pitchers have to bat, and you don't have anybody to pinch hit. It, yeah. It's terrible, terrible, terrible roster management all the way around. Yeah, I, I don't... I do not understand the risk that they're taking with these guys because, again, it's about what is the point. The point is to protect the future. And sometimes in this case, like, you almost got to think about protecting the future from the players themselves because a player is not going to come to tell the manager, hey, I can't play, I'm hurt. Every single player wants to play more. From Moose to India to Senzel to Kino to whoever – they're not going to tell the manager, hey, I can't play. Like, that's not in the DNA of a player. So this is where the team has to step in. This is where the team has to say, look, you're not right. We want you to be right. We also know that you're a key member of this team moving forward. And we don't want to jeopardize what you might look next year just to play you tomorrow against the Nationals. Like that just it, it doesn't make sense to me. And I know that they said that they did an MRI or something on on India and that it came back clean. Fine. This is an eye test thing. And we know we you can see it with your own eyes. If he doesn't look right, follow the eye test. Here's what I know. Jonathan India hates to come out of games. Yeah. And on more than one occasion. Since the injury in Dyersville, he is asked to be taken out of a game. Yeah. That tells me everything I need to know. I'm ready right now, Jeff. Hot take of the day. I'm calling right now for the Reds to shut Jonathan India down for the rest of the season. Yeah. Shut him down. Let him I, heal. I, Start fresh next season. I agree. And, and the only thing that I think I'm looking at this for, and I'm just wondering, it's like, are the Reds waiting till September when the rosters expand, they get another batter, they get another pitcher and things like that. It's like, are they just trying to limp to September? And then we're going to see a bunch of these IL moves because that's the only thing that makes any more sense. If we're trying to explain it in a positive light, because then you can call up Spencer Steer, who by the way, he's been playing all over the place here recently. So I think they're getting him ready for something, which I know that you had mentioned off air. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing if that's the case, because I want to see Spencer steer up here. Well, you know, when I sat down and talked with him last week, Jeff, you know, he talked about being able to play all over the place and that he, he liked being able to move around and get a, a feel at different positions. And since that conversation uh, for the first time in his professional career, the reds have started him in the outfield and they've started him at first base. So, you know, I can see a scenario shaping up where September 1st gets here, he comes up, and now they move him all over the place and use him as kind of a super utility. I could see that happening. Uh, if they do that, then that's great. We'll get a look at him. He'll get some experience. Uh, we'll get to see kind of what he has to offer. He'll get a taste. I'm not convinced they're going to. I still think there's something to this whole idea of them wanting to stagger when they're bringing up these young guys and and have them uh, available uh, long term. But September, I think, is late enough that if that's really the case, if you're really worried about when their clocks will start to run out and when you would have to trade them, I mean, you can always leave them down till May next season when this yeah. when when the season gets underway. So I think it's really a question about how they want to handle him to best promote his development versus anything else at this point. Right. And then, you know, you also look at the fact that you, you probably put one of these guys on the IL, you can call up an outfielder to give you some more depth out there. You can stick Alejo Lopez at second base for the rest of the year and not worry about that because I do want to see more from Alejo Lopez anyway. And you can set Jonathan India down for the rest of the year. I agree with your hot take. That's what should happen. But all in all, I feel like 
there are moves and I, I've complained about, I complained about it yesterday um, on the show. We're complaining about it right now. Like this is what they need to do. They need to put moose India and Senzel on the IL, whether any of those three come back, that's completely up to the training staff and whether everybody's healthy and ready to go. Then you call up Spencer steer, you call up an outfielder, you call up somebody else. I don't know. There's somebody else that's healthy at triple a, the reds aren't going anywhere this year. There's, there's no reason to risk these guys future health. No, you know, for the outfield, you know, there's a couple of young guys down there. They could get a look at if they wanted to. And if they don't, again, if they want to, if they're worried about how many guys they're bringing up this season, you know, they just signed, uh, what's his name? Piscotti. Piscotti. Steven Piscotti. Piscotti. They just yeah. signed Piscotti who uh, spent time with Oakland. Uh, that's a guy that you have no risk, all reward. You bring him up. If he, if he becomes great, if he hits well at great American ballpark, well, then, you know, you've got a, a, a piece for next year that can maybe factor into a fourth outfielder role, something like that. If he comes up and he's horrible, he, he takes up the roster spot. He plays out the year and you cut him and you're not out anything. Right. And, and I, I think that this just follows along with what we're saying. The Reds need to protect the future. Even if that means protecting the players from themselves They've got to be honest about health of guys and they not just say, oh, well, hey, they're playing through something like, yeah, OK, whatever. Everybody's playing through something at this point in the year. You need to be honest about what that is that they're playing through and if they should be playing through it. That's right. And, you know, even as much complaining as we're doing about this roster, Jeff, there are still some young arms on the active roster right now that oh, yeah. we can kind of be excited to talk about and that we do want to see more and of, more of. You and I are going to break that down uh, coming up. But uh, the Reds are in to D.C., Jeff, and on the mound is Mike Miner. And I want to tell you that the, uh, the odds makers are not confident in Mike Miner. The Reds are plus 132 with Mike Miner. On the mound, the over-under is eight and a half uh, with the Nationals throwing a guy making his major league debut. What do you think about this game? I think that even bet online understands that a guy making his major league debut has a better shot of winning than Mike minor. But I also look at this and I say, both of these lineups are huge question marks and you could flip a coin as to whether or not they're going to do anything. So I'm not touching it. Not going anywhere near it. Huh? I, I'm not, not I'm not, going not taking anywhere the near over. Anything. No, no, no. <laughs> yes. For the first time in my life, I am not hitting the over. All right. Well, listen, if you want to figure out what games you can bet today, head over to betonline.net right now because betonline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your betting needs. You can find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for the odds, lines, and games. You can find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, all of the combat sports, esports, and even golf. You want to talk about taking an over? You can take the over all day long on whatever Jeff's number is. Whew. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports wagering information from live in-game betting scores and podcasts. They have you covered. Head to Bet Online today. You can use your computer or your mobile device to learn more about the action happening right now. Bet Online. It's where the game starts. Coming up on Monday's podcast, I am going to uh, release my full interview with Annie Sabo uh, as a separate bonus track in the audio and video feed uh, as the lefty in the bullpen with Annie Sabo. That's going to be a great conversation I want for you to hear. We've really been fortunate with uh, the guests that have come in and sat down and talked to us. We've had Matt McLean. We've had Spencer Steer. We've had Annie Sabo stock by, and there's lots more coming. Make sure you are subscribed to the audio channel make sure you are subscribed to the youtube feed click the bell so you get a notification every time we drop something every time we go live you won't miss any of it all right jeff we talked about what we didn't like with this roster we talked about the guys that were probably in need of being shut down but let's talk for a minute about a couple guys that we do want to see the rest of the way particularly a couple pitchers that while they got off to rough starts and one a little bit more rough than the other, they pitched well last night. And in the case of starter, Justin Dunn seems to be starting to put it together a little bit and getting a little bit better each time out. 
Yeah, you'll take that line all day, every day. Six innings, a two-run ball for him. And, and that's something that you know most good pitchers do. And we're talking about Justin Dunn as a potential fourth or fifth option in this starting rotation. So it's not as if he has to set the world on fire every time he goes out. But he also had five strikeouts. But more than that, Steve, like, yes, everybody saw the line, but the reason that he was good was the underlying stuff. As as baseball savant kind of points out to us, he did a very good job at limiting hard contact. And and you talk those numbers, you just you put out a lot of numbers and you think, yeah, that's a pretty decent line, but let's put that in perspective for just a minute. Two runs in six innings against this Phillies lineup that can mash the baseball. I mean, we saw Schwarber from Middletown put one nearly over the batter's eye. I mean, it's, it's like this lineup that. can mash and, and for, for Dunn to have held them the way that he did, I think was tremendous progress in what we've seen from him this season. And it gives me, uh, puts me in a position to want to see more. I want to see his next start now to yeah. see if he can continue to build upon that. Yeah, because as these numbers say, he was very successful with his breaking pitches. He got both his slider and his curveball were over 40% on the whiff rate like guys just weren't he was doing a good job of mixing those up and and confusing hitters as to which one was coming at him and the fastball really just kind of set everything up kept him in good counts and things like that but more than that the average exit velo against him was 82 which is really really good because the league average is like 88 the only hard hit ball that he gave up was off of his changeup, and he only threw his changeup four times. He's kind of like Hunter Green in that aspect where he's working on his changeup, not quite confident with it just yet. But overall, that is the kind of performance that I want to see. I'm not expecting uh, free pizza every time Justin Dunn is pitching. <laughs> like I, I just want him to limit the lineup, and that's exactly what he did. And let's be honest with that average exit velocity. Uh, you know, it was 82. It would have been in the 70s if not for Schwarber hitting a ball 500 miles an hour d- directly to straightaway center field. I mean, and that changeup was put to the point where you and I probably could have hit it over the wall. Like that was, pretty, it was a bad much. pitch. It was a bad pitch. Very much so. <laughs> very, very much so. But listen, I'm excited that the whiff rate, you know, is improving. The, the hard contact yes. is not really there. Uh, you know, we talked about this when we talked early in the season about what we wanted to see from Nick Lodolo and Hunter Green and Graham Ashcraft, which is we wanted them to come out and, and have their start and find successes and then go in between starts, work on some things, come back and get better and develop and move forward and make improvements. And I see Dunn starting to do that. And I think it's very exciting. Now, listen, is he going to be a fourth or fifth starter? Maybe, maybe not. Is he going to be a bullpen guy? Maybe, you know, some people projected him that way. And if he can find this kind of success in the starting lineup and the starting rotation, rather, where you thinking of him, maybe a fourth, maybe a fifth, and then somebody comes along and beats him out for those spots. That's a tremendous bullpen asset. Then at that point, if he can come out and throw his best two pitches, having figured out some of these major league hitters, I think he's got a lot of upside. I think that, you know, his early, his early uh, problems, was some nerves was some just needing to figure out the league and it's a lot of learning. And now that he's getting to work with Derek Johnson on an everyday basis and continue to get better, I'm, I'm really excited for him. Yeah. And that's something that I've said before too, is that, you know, I'm still a little bit skeptical about him, but this was a big step in the right direction. There was somebody else that had a nice game last night. And again, it was just a relief appearance. He threw 19 pitches, but Dowry Moretta is back. He was called up yesterday as they put TJ Zoic on the injured list And with Moretta back, he is a guy, he's got the talent, I think, to be a dude in this bullpen. He's had a couple of really bad outings earlier this season that has inflated that ERA number that everybody looks to. But as we continually try to tell people, please do not judge relievers on their ERA. That is not a stat that adequately explains their abilities and I feel like Dowry Moretta shows that he's got a lot to offer he just he kind of has something that I think that hitters can probably peg a little bit so he's got to work on adjusting that a little bit you know with Moretta I mean if you look at what got him here to this point you know he he came on the scene in triple a and just absolutely owned triple a And we kept wondering, why isn't he here? Why isn't he here? Why haven't they called him up? Because at that time, the Reds' bullpen was absolutely horrid. And you have this guy lighting up the world down in Louisville. And they didn't bring him up. 
And I think maybe now we're understanding that a little bit more because he hasn't quite put it all together consistently. Uh, he's shown enough that it makes me want to see more. It makes me want the Reds to give him more of an opportunity. Uh, but at the end of the day, he, like a couple other guys we've talked about, Jeff, really needs to utilize this time to prove it to show that he can continue to grow and get better and, and at least pitch himself into the conversation for 2023 and, and a spring training invite and the ability to compete at camp to get a roster spot with this team because he hasn't put enough together for me to say he's even earned that right at this point. But as we've talked about, a lost season, it doesn't matter. Let's get repetition versus results. Run him out there as much as you can. I would rather see Dowry Moretta the rest of the way than ever seeing Hunter Strickland pitch again. No, nope. no more Hunter Strickland. We're done there. Like, there's so many open spots in this bullpen for next year, and I feel like Dowry Moretta has the shot to at least get one next year, and then he can prove whether he's going to be here whenever the team's good or not. But this bullpen is really something that I want the Reds to focus on in the offseason, but also – they've still got plenty of dudes that they can figure out what they have in the tank and what they can offer them in the future. Dara Moretta is really at the top of that list for me. And I, and I want to see more. Yeah, I, I do too. And and you look at him, Jeff, and he's kind of reminiscent a little bit of Amir Garrett. I know you were looking mm. at how he's utilizing his pitches. And I think like Garrett, he is over relying on his slider. And these are major league hitters that he's facing. Uh, at some point, they're just going to figure it out and tag it, right? And that's what happened with Amir Garrett. And I think that's what's happening with Moretta as well, because I think he's just overusing that pitch. Right. He's Amir Garrett. He's just right-handed. And if he doesn't drop that slider into the strike zone, then hitters will lay off of it and wait for him to throw that fastball that, while it is a little bit fast, it's it's not fast enough, and I don't think it has enough spin on it. It's it's one of those things where the hitters can just tag that fastball. So, but, but you know, there's a lot of baseball left to play, and we are excited to see what progress guys like Justin Dunn and Dowry Moretta and some of the other young arms in this pitching staff have left to do and what they can do before the end of the season. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I'm, I'm, listen, we keep trying to tell everybody they're as bad as things are. There are things to be excited about. There are things to pay attention to with this team. Listen, Jeff, uh, coming up in the next segment, uh, you know, I, I teased it a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I was joined earlier this week for a full interview with, uh, Bally Sports Ohio pre and post game show host Annie Sabo. She stopped by for an episode of the Lefty in the Bullpen. Uh, one of the things I asked her was to to tell me of the rookie starting pitchers uh, who was her favorite of the big three, and her answer might surprise you. So coming up here in the third segment, we have part of that conversation, and we're going to run that for you right after this. Uh, of those three guys, which one would you point at as having had the most successful season thus far? Who, who, which of the three has impressed you the most? Well, it's so funny because we started the season talking about Hunter Green, and I still think he has tremendous upside. Has he been the most consistent? Obviously not, but I feel like all the attention was on him. And I still enjoy so much watching him pitch, and I think that it's still been a learning curve or learning process so far this season from him for him, but Graham Ashcraft, my go-to, I think he is fabulous, not only from a pitch arsenal perspective, I think his cutting fastball is just excellent, but from a winning perspective too, I mean, I've covered so many of his starts and the Reds always have a chance to win with him on the mound. I think he is gutsy. I think, you know, even if he doesn't have his best stuff, he does a really nice job of adjusting and figuring out, hey, what pitches can I throw to to get an out here or to induce a ground ball, which he's done a great, great job of all season long. So I just think his ability to adjust when things are not going his way or to adjust when he realizes, hey, I don't have my be my best fastball tonight or my best slider or nothing seems to be working. He always delivers such a consistent performance, gutsy performance, and gives the, the Reds a chance to win. So he's my number one right now. I know Nick Lodolo came off a great start in his last one just a couple of days ago. I think that all three of those rookies are showing great signs of promise moving forward. So that's why I do think the Reds will be competitive from a starting rotation standpoint in a couple of years, just matter the learning curve for these young guys. But yeah, Graham Ashcraft, whenever he goes out, my favorite, uh, 
Love to watch him pitch. And I think he brings a lot of heart to the mound. No slight to Hunter Green by any means. Do I think that his debut was overhyped? I agree. But then again, we're in the media and that's what we do. And fans love to see rookies come up and, and make their debut. Um, but I think both Green and Lodolo have done a, a great job. They've shown signs of greatness. I think it's just a matter of harnessing what they do best and becoming more consistent on a day-to-day -day basis because, well, I mean, from Green and Lodolo, we have seen great, great starts. I mean, starts, it look, I mean, you look at their stat line and you're in the same conversation as like, you know, a DeGrom and Scherzer type numbers. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't been at a consistent level this season, but I mean, the Ashcraft, Lodolo, and um, Hunter Green, one, two, three punch is going to be scary. Come, um, Yeah, I mean, 2024, I can see that. But, yeah, I mean, great young guys, plenty of upside, consistency is only going to grow. And I think people forget, too, it's like their workload has never been this much in their young careers. So they're getting used to, you know, Monday through Friday preparing for a start. What do I do? What do I eat? How do I sleep? I mean, there's so much that goes into it in your first big league year, and these guys have done – Tremendous jobs and have passed the test with flying colors, all three of them. Obviously, Ashcraft has been the most consistent and the and kind of my favorite to watch as of this season. But I mean, come next season, they have one one year under their belt. I think it's gonna be fun come next year. All right. I am so glad I got to spend some time with Annie Sabo. That full episode is going to drop as a bonus episode into your feeds on Monday. Make sure you are subscribed so you do not miss any of it. Uh, I think that's a good spot to wrap up the show today. Uh, thanks for making a Locked on Reds your first listen. Uh, coming up next week, we're going to break down this series with the Washington Nationals. We are going to continue to keep you caught up on lots of transactions because uh, the Reds are going to be making moves. Uh, uh, thanks for making us your first listen. Now make your second listen, the Locked On MLB podcast. MLB expert Paul Francis Sullivan brings you humor, passion, and his unique perspective on every team and the biggest stories around the league. You can follow the number one daily league-wide podcast, Locked On MLB, on the Audacity app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Jeff, that's going to do it for us this week. Lots of things to watch with the Reds. What can the people expect from us? They can expect that we'll keep them up to date on the roster management of this team. And we'll keep up, up to date on what the young guys are doing because we're going to be locked on Reds every single day.